Amen. Go ahead and be seated. Second service, man, I love to worship with you guys. It's so good to be here with you. Such an honor to be here to talk about Jesus a little bit today. Man, I wish I had an opportunity to come up there and shake your hand and give you a hug and say thanks for coming to church today, man. That's important for you to be here today, man. Our students just got back from camp. Nick mentioned that earlier, so if you gave your life to Christ at camp, you should follow that up by being baptized. Talk to somebody about that. That'd be awesome. We just had a group get back from Promise Keepers as well. And today is the last day. If you want to nominate a lay elder, you can do that. Paulland.org slash lay elder. They help serve, provide leadership for our church or nominated by you. So if you got somebody, I'd really appreciate that, man. Welcome to the live stream with us today. If you're on the live stream out there, and we got a lot of folks, a lot of places on the live stream, man. Become a live stream evangelist. Invite somebody to come be on the live stream with you, to watch with you, man. Anyway, it's good to be here today. I want to talk a little bit about uh, a sermon today called Don't Miss Your Opportunity. Don't miss your opportunity. We serve a God who deals in opportunities. He always provides us opportunities, but he does it in the most unexpected way, all right? So if you just look at some of the stories in Scripture last week, C.J. Lucky preaching on Moses and the burning bush. Here's Moses, man. He's been tending sheep in the desert for 40 years years, day after day, brother, getting up in the morning, just grinding, going out there, going to work for 40 years, but one day, in the most unexpected nature, God shows up and speaks to him in the form of a burning bush. Hey, I got an opportunity for you, Moses. Just the way God works, think about the apostle Peter, man, he's a fisherman, him and Andrew, James, John, they go out fishing every day, they're just fishing, that's what they do day after day, but one day, Jesus shows up. Hey, push out in the deep, let down your nets for a catch. Come follow me. It's an unexpected opportunity. This is just how God works, right? I can remember we've got a team right now that's on mission trip in the Ukraine. Wendell Box is leading that team. They're working with Ed Dixon over there. And uh, they're in Ukraine. And uh, I went to Ukraine back in 2019, the end of 2019, uh, right around the end. They, did, they do those things where they take kids to McDonald's call them McJoyful, where they, they go, it, it's every kid's dream in Ukraine to get to go to a McDonald's. And uh, so all these orphan kids have never had the opportunity to do it. So he'll go into an orphanage, load up all the kids, take them down to McDonald's and have a happy birthday Jesus celebration down there. So we went over to help him do that. And we were doing that during the day and we were over there for New Year's Eve. And over there, they invited us, our church says it's New Year's Eve, we all get together, we worship, we eat, have a big celebration, we want you to come. So we said, okay, so we load up. We go over there, and before it started, we were up in the pastor's office. You know, our whole team was up there, and we're hanging around with the pastor, and the pastor says to us, he says, yeah, we're doing this thing tonight. We've got somebody getting married. And I said, well, that's kind of cool. And he said, yeah. He said, you know, I'm kind of tired. You want, you want to do it for me? I was like, like me? Like, I thought he was kidding. Yeah, I'm kind of tired. You think you could do the wedding for me? I'm like, dude, is that even legal? Can I marry somebody in the Ukraine and it actually work? I don't even know if that works. Oh, yeah, that's fine. It'll be fine. You can do it for me. I said, well, how do you even do a marriage in Ukraine? He goes, however you do it in America, it'll be fine. And so, dude, I married somebody in the Ukraine, all right? Talk about an unexpected. I, I thought I should call Wendell and say, dude, check on that couple. See if they're still married or not, right? It was crazy. Then I went on a mission trip one time to India. We had a team, a whole team of people went to Andhra Pradesh, India. And uh, we fly all the way over there, which it's a long ways to get over there, like a 30-hour. We get there. We get there early in the morning, Sunday morning. They pick us up on a bus. We're on this bus. And dude's up there driving. Or traffic's crazy. And the, and the guy says, he's on the phone. He turns around. And he says, hey, I got a friend that's got a church. We're going to go to church this morning. I was like, well, that's cool. We're going to go to church in India. Then he says, the guy says he wants one of you to preach. Anybody in here can preach? Of course, everybody in the whole bus was just like, Brr. like you're the only guy. I'm like, I guess that's me. And so he goes, good, we'll be there in 15 minutes. I'm like, 15 minutes? No, 15 minutes to prepare, man. That's an unexpected. But, uh, man, we got there, and this church was huge, man. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people in India, and they were packed in there like sitting in the aisle, standing on the wall. They're just in there everywhere. And I'm like, I got the opportunity to preach in India, man. It was so great. I had some people make a decision to give their life to Christ or anything. This is just how God works. He, he works in the most unexpected way. So what I want to look at today is I want, how do we not miss our opportunities, all right? I want to do it from 1 Samuel 
16. So if you have your Bible, open it up to 1 Samuel 16. If you don't, you can look it up on your phone. You can put it up on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, I give you one. Just stop by on the connection on the way out and ask him. We'll get you a Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Uh, VBS starts in, in one week. Nick mentioned this earlier. Not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow, uh, VBS starts. VBS is basically a four-day camp for kids. Starts with those going into kindergarten through fifth grade. 6.30 at night, it goes for two hours. We do games, rec, all kinds of stuff. We also have Ignite Week, which is kids going into sixth grade through the eighth. And they have a time of worship and, and the rec as well. And it's a great opportunity to do that. They're teaching on the life of David. And so to kind of tag in onto that, I want to take a look at the life of David as well. First Samuel 16 is the call of David. All right, and David's one of the greatest kings, Israel, the greatest king other than Jesus that Israel ever had. And this is how it came about. All right, First Samuel 16, 1. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn over Saul for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Or as it says in the ESV, I have provided for myself a king from Jesse. I provided for myself a king. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. Now Samuel was one of the great Old Testament prophets. He's also what's known as the last of the Old Testament judges. So when the nation of Israel went into the promised land, they were ruled by a series of, of people called judges. So like Samson, Gideon, Deborah, Ehud, the last one of those judges was our man Samuel, all right? And when Samuel got older, he appointed his son to be judges, except his sons did not walk in the Lord the way he did. So the, the elders of Israel, this is in 1 Samuel 8, came to Samuel and said, dude, we don't want your sons. Appoint for us a king like the other nations have. We've been looking around at the other nations. Dude, they all got a king that leads them. We want a king. And Samuel was kind of mad about it. He said, I'm not going to give you a king. And God told Samuel, he said, hey, they don't, they're not rejecting you, bro. They're rejecting me. Because up to that point, God had been their king. But they wanted a king like the other nations had a king. And so God gave them what they wanted. This is always sometimes be careful what you look, hope for. God might give it to you. They gave him a king. And he was a son of a guy named Kish. It's recorded for us in 1 Samuel 9. There's a man named Kish. He was a prominent man, a man of standing, and he had a son, and the son's name was Saul, 1 Samuel 9, 2. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. An impressive young man, more impressive than anybody without equal in all the Israelites, he was a head taller. If you're going to pick a dude to be king, you're like, this is the guy right here. Dude, he's taller than everybody else. He's more handsome than everybody else. He comes from a better family than anybody else. This is the guy. We want this guy to be our King Saul, the first king of Israel. So 1 Samuel chapter 10, Samuel anoints him as king of Israel, and he became king of Israel. And uh, one problem Saul had, though, Saul was a guy that looked great on the outside, but he was lacking in one thing, and that was faith. Faith is taking God at his word and acting upon it. And Saul would always give the appearance that he was following God. But when it got right down to it, dude, he wouldn't quite pull it off. In other words, Samuel tells him after he became king, hey, go to this town called Gilgal. We're going to go to war with the Philistines. You wait for me seven days. When I get there, we'll offer the sacrifices, and God will tell us what to do. So he went to Gilgal just like Samuel told him. But when he got there, there were so many of the enemy army, his army started freaking out. They started in deserting him, running off, leaving him alone. And the longer he waited, the fewer soldiers he got. And he got so scared, it became the seventh day. He's like, dude, I can't wait any longer. Bring me the worship. Bring me the sacrifice. And he, as a king, outside of his responsibility, begins to offer this sacrifice unto God. And right when he finishes, Samuel shows up. And Samuel's like, dude, what are you doing? You were supposed to wait till I got here to offer that sacrifice. And he said, well, man, all, the, all my troops are leaving. I had to do it, right? And Samuel says to him, and this is recorded in 1 Samuel 13, 14, now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. In other words, God told him to do this, and he almost did it, but he didn't quite do it because he didn't really have faith. He trusted himself, 
more than he trusted in God. And because of that, God took the kingdom away from him. In 1 Samuel 15, he was supposed to go to war with the Amalekites and just wipe them out and destroy them all. That's what God said. But instead, he kept some of the best for himself and he kept the king alive. Right? It was just like he would do it almost all the way. He gave the appearance. You thought this was a really good guy, but when it got right down to it, he was lacking in faith. All right? So God rejected him as king, although he was still king. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, the Lord then, after a little period of time, says to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn over Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said to him, verse 2, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and he will kill me. Dude, God, don't forget, Saul's still king. If I go anoint somebody else king, he's going to come and kill me, which gives you a little bit of an idea about Saul's character. So the Lord says, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said and he arrived at Bethlehem. Okay, this is where Jesse was from. The elders of the city trembled when they met him. Do you come in peace, they asked. And Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. And when they arrived, Jesse and his sons, Samuel saw Eliab, which was the eldest, probably the firstborn. And he immediately thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Oh, this, this got to be the dude right here. He's bigger than everybody else. He looks great. He'd be the perfect King, surely the Lord's anointed stands before me. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I've rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Key verse of both 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel right here. Man does not see as God sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. What's really matter to God is what's going on on the inside not what's going on on the outside. Now, you just think about this verse right here. You think about how, as believers, this would change our lives if we saw things in the same way. In other words, if what was most important to us was not what was on the outside of a person, not their wealth, not their appearance, not what they look like, not how old they are, not how popular they were, not how successful they were, but what was most important to us was really what was going on on the inside. Think how that would change. Number one, you know what that means? Color would no longer matter. Right? Age would no longer matter. Sex would no longer matter. The, you know, the appearance, how much money somebody had, how many following they had, what they looked like, all that wouldn't matter. That's all just the way man does it. We look on the outside, but God looks on the inside. God says, hey, why, why did he want to, why did Samuel think this firstborn? Because you know what? He looked just like Saul. He's taller, he's more handsome. God said, hey man, I rejected him. I don't see things like you see things. I don't look at the outside. I see on the inside. So they, they called the second son of Benadab and had him pass in front of, of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen him either. Jesse then had Shemal pass, son number three. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen him. He had seven of his sons pass before Samuel one after another. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen thee. So finally he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? And they're still the youngest or the smallest, Jesse Anders, but he's tending the sheep. Well, I got one more, but I didn't even invite him. He's out tending the sheep. So Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Now, sometimes when you read the Old Testament, uh, it kind of cracks you up and you think of the practicality of something. In this case, when they sacrificed a heifer, in this case, what they would do is they get the whole town together. They would sacrifice that unto the Lord. And then they would turn around and cook the meat, and then they would have a big feast for the whole city. So it was a time of sacrifice, but it was also a time of celebration because they would take all that meat and cook it and give some to everybody. And if you lived, you know, in Israel in those days, you didn't get meat very often. And, but on this day, brother, we're eating ribeyes, right? We're eating tenderloin. We're eating brisket. We're eating roast. We're eating it all. One day right here, we're having meat, man. 
right? So they're sacrificing this animal. I always think about the people that had to cook this thing. Imagine you're the people back in the kitchen and you're preparing all this and then he's out there, you know, doing his thing with Jesse. You don't even know what he's doing, Jesse's son. And then you're thinking, okay, we're going to eat in 15 minutes. I got it all ready to go. It's perfect. And uh, then all at once Samuel says, dude, we're not sitting down until you go get Jesse, son David. When he says we're not sitting down, you know what he means? Say, we're not going to eat until you go get David. Dude, how far is David away? Where is this kid? He's out tending sheep. Who knows where the guy's even at? And what's it take to get him? You ain't going to drive in your four-wheel drive. No, you've got to walk over there and get him, and you're going to walk back and bring him to you. How long did that take? Are you just sitting there going, dude, what's going on with Samuel? The food's getting cold. We're all excited about this, and we're waiting on this kid. Just the practicality of this moment. They finally go and get him, come all the way back. They bring this in there. Samuel said, send for him. We're not going to sit down. Verse 12, so he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy, which either means he had a great complexion or maybe he meant he had red hair with a fine appearance and had handsome features. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He's the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power Samuel then went home to Ramah. Now, this is a story of the anointing of David. A couple of things about this. When you read Scripture, number one, you're going to notice right away that God's the one that chose David, right? I mean, we read that Scripture, dude. God chose David. All down, no, we're not choosing. And he did it in the most unexpected manner. Like, this wasn't who Samuel thought. He thought it was going to be the first one. It wasn't through who Jesse thought. Jesse didn't even invite him to the party, Right? I mean, I think David probably showed up and he's like, really, me? I'm going to be king? I'm the youngest? I'm the smallest? I mean, it was the most unexpected thing on that day, but this is just kind of the way God works. God always chooses the most unlikely people. He's always taking somebody that's unlikely. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 says, man, God's always choosing the foolish things of the world to confound the wise or the weak things to confound the strong. So if you just go back and look at some of the people that God chose, whether it was Rahab the prostitute or Isaac the deceiver or Mary when she's not even married yet and she's going to get pregnant or, or whoever, you know, Peter the fisherman. Jesus just has a way, God has a way of using the most unlikely people which is good news if you consider yourself to be an unlikely person. If you're thinking, well, God probably would never use somebody like me, guess what? You just go to the top of the list, all right? God can use whoever he wants. God chose David, right? And not only God chose him, uh, Samuel revealed him. People knew God did it because he anointed him in the presence of his brothers. So that's why I said if you got saved at camp, you should be baptized because that reveals your faith to everyone. God chose him. Samuel revealed him. Yet in spite of all that, I want you to know, man, David still could have missed it. He gets this unexpected opportunity. He gets anointed king. Not that he could somehow miss out on being king because all my God in his sovereignty said he was going to be king, but he could have missed out. He could have missed out on being the type of king that God really needed. I mean, you got Saul. Saul was anointed. Saul was chosen. Saul was empowered by the Holy Spirit, and he failed. Here you have David. David shows up. David could have said, dude, I can't do this. I don't deserve to be king. I don't know how to be king. I'm too young to be king. I can't be king. I won't be king. He could have missed out on it. But the reality was, all David had to do, really, you see, was believe it. Because God said it, If David just believed it, then God would empower him to be able to do it. Because God said it, all David had to do was believe it. And in believing it, God would actually empower him to accomplish it. See, David was chosen by God. Here's the reality. If you're a believer in Jesus, you've been chosen by God. God chose to give you the opportunity to become a believer. He opened your minds to the gospel. He opened your ability to see. He chose you if you're a believer in Jesus. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, for he, talking about God, chose us in him as believers before the creation of the world. Like when God chose David, God did not choose David based on his achievements. 
Like we think, well, he is a man after God's own heart, so God picked him because of his achievement. He hadn't done anything yet. He's just a kid. God chose him based on his potential. He has a heart, so I believe he can be the king that I need in Israel. He didn't, base him, he didn't choose him based on his achievements. He chose him based on his potential. God, if, if you're a believer in Jesus, God did not choose you because of your achievements. Because we don't, we don't enter into salvation by achievement. It's strictly an act of grace by faith, right? Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you are saved through faith. God didn't choose you because of your achievement. He chose you because of your potential. To be, he chose you not to be a king, but to be a child of the king, right? To be a part of the kingdom so that you could further his kingdom, right? He's got a call on your life, right? And, and, and what I'm saying is if you can see it and believe it, you can be it if it's God's word. If God calls you to do something just like that, right? If, if it's God's word, if you can believe it, God will empower you to do it. Right, Because the most important thing for the anointed of God, the chosen of God, is to do God's word. The whole thing hinged on the ability. What was Samuel, Saul's great failure? He didn't keep God's word. What was going to be the success of David? Whether or not he was willing to keep God's word or not. If he was willing to keep God's word, he would live up to his potential. This is what God wanted to do. He he, he, just like God chose him, God's chosen you and your success will determine if you keep, because here's our problem. Everybody in here, we all got a Saul right here. We're born with him. We got a Saul inside of us. And we might look like we're walking by faith and we might act like we're really following God, but when it gets right down to it, we're going to do what we think is best for us rather than what God calls us to do. Right at the last minute, we're going to self-preserve ourselves because we're most important. So we're going to be a, there's a Saul, but with Jesus, you can become a David. We all have a Saul, but by the power of Jesus, we, we can become a David, right? So don't miss your opportunity, right? So like, for instance, in um, Luke chapter 18 and Mark chapter 10, you have a story you guys are probably all familiar with. It's the story of the rich young ruler. This guy comes to Jesus. He's rich. He's young. He's a ruler. He has tremendous potential. He looks great on the outside. He comes to Jesus and asks Jesus a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's a great question, man. Maybe like ask Jesus that. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, you know, uh, you know the commandments, Doubt, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal, don't do all those things. This kid says, man, I've done that since my youth. In other words, he thought that salvation was based on achievement. I've done all those things, I've achieved it. But we know that salvation is not based on achievement, it's based on faith. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of works, least any man should boast. What's faith? Taking God at his word and acting upon it. Romans 10 uh, nine, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. By faith, you make Jesus Christ Lord. In other words, he's more important to you than you, right? This is the aspect of salvation. This guy thinks he's going to get to go to heaven because of his achievement. He goes, I've done all that stuff. And it says in Mark chapter 10, verse 25, it says that Jesus looked at this guy and loved him. Jesus looked at him. See it right there? 10, 21, Jesus looked at him. That word looked right there, bleepo in the Greek, it doesn't mean to look with your physical eyes. He didn't look at him like we would look at somebody. It means that Jesus looked at him like only God could see him. God, Jesus looked at his heart. Jesus looked at him, saw everything about him, still loved him. And so he says to them, okay, uh, you know, okay, here, here I'll, I'll tell you, one thing you lack Go and sell all you have, give it away to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. It's one thing you lack. Go sell all you have, give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now, this isn't given to us as if this is something we can do and go to heaven when we die. In other words, this isn't a word for us. This is a word for this guy. But the minute Jesus spoke that word, if he could have just believed it, and done it by faith, it would have become a reality in his life. Because what Jesus did is Jesus gave him something to do that would require 
faith because Jesus looked at this guy and knew that inside his heart that money was more important to him than God. And so the only way he could trust God rather than his money was by faith, forsaking his money and trusting in God. So he gives him the one act of faith that he must do to prove that God is more important to him than money. Hey, give all your money away and come follow me. Have treasure in heaven. Make Jesus Christ Lord of your life. That means he's more important than your money. It was an act of faith for him to be able to do this. Now, we look at this passage of Scripture and we're thinking, God, it's so hard. What if God asked me to do that? That, that? that should be so hard to do. But I look at it completely different. What it was in reality was the greatest opportunity this guy had ever given. Just think if he had done it. I, I really believe if he would have done it, he would have had trouble doing it because I, I believe that if he had started trying to give all his money away, the more he gave away, the more God would just be given him and he would have just become this channel of blessing. Because this is what God wants to do for all of us. It isn't about us experiencing God's life as God just comes and fills me up and I'm like, oh man, I'm so great. No, what God wants to do is he wants you to become a channel of blessing. He wants to pour blessings into your life that you can then take and give away to others that through he just becomes a channel working through you like that. I believe this guy would have started giving his money away. God would have just given him more and he started going through his life. Think about what would have happened in his life. He would have made the world a better place. He would have been laying up some for himself treasure in heaven. And dude, everybody would have loved this guy. I mean, he would have, they would have, you would not be reading about the rich young Lou who went away sad because he had much money. You'd be reading about the generous giver that God poured his blessing out and on in such a way that he was able to be a blessing to all these other people with what God had given to him. We'd be reading about the generous giver instead of the rich young ruler who went away sad because he had much wealth, right? It was an opportunity. Jesus says to him, man, go sell all you have. And, uh, Come and you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Dude, that's the greatest opportunity ever given to anybody. Jesus ain't going around saying, come follow me to very many people back in the day when he was on his earth. The opportunity to follow Jesus? Are you kidding? Dude, what an opportunity. The dude missed it. He goes away sad because he had much money. Why? Because God gave him an opportunity to stop being a Saul persevere in himself and start being a David and doing what God wanted him to do. When the minute Jesus said that to him, if he could have believed it, God could have empowered him to do it. And man, the blessing would have been his, right? He would have went from being a Saul to a David. You, you look at the story of David and you kind of wonder, you're like, well, dude, why did, why did God anoint him king while Saul was still king? Like Saul's still king and he anoints David king and obviously he can't become king because there's only one king and Saul's the king. Why didn't he just wait and do it later? Why did he do it with such a young man? And here's the reason, because, because many times when God calls us to something great, there's a period of time between when he calls us or when he anoints it and when he fulfills it in our life. There's a period of time between when he calls us and when he fulfills it. And that point in between is time of preparation. God just working on you, getting you prepared. If God had asked David to do some of the stuff he did when he was king, when he was a young man, he couldn't have handled it. God had to prepare him, right? It's the same way with us. God has something for us over here, right? And he, maybe he calls us over here. What's that in between? It's a time for you to get prepared. What should I do in that in-between time when I don't want to do? You get prepared because God's going to give you an unexpected opportunity one of these days. And it's not going to happen unless you're prepared. So you say, well, how do I prepare for that? Well, say, say I want to say, man, I really like to be used by God to lead somebody else to the Christ, you know, lead somebody to the Lord. Well, you know what? You should, you should work on how to make a gospel presentation. Well, I really like to pray for somebody and encourage them and be a blessing to them. Then you should learn how to pray. I really like to be able to answer people's questions about the Bible. People ask me questions about the Bible. I don't know how to answer. Well, you should study your Bible. You should get prepared in the meantime. But as you're getting prepared, the one thing you have to answer is this man I'm going to do whatever God asks me to do whatever God's word says that's what I'm going to do because if you don't make that decision in advance when that unexpected opportunity comes it's going to be so huge you'll have a tendency to act like Saul rather than David and you'll miss your opportunity right so when you look at the story of David the story of David's not in the Bible to make us think David's a great guy. 
He's not there as an example. Oh, I should be like David. The story of David is in the Bible for one reason, and that's to point us to the true and better David, who is Jesus Christ. The David in the Old Testament is just a type pointing us to Jesus Christ, who is our only hope. So you think about Jesus Christ. You know, uh, talk about the most unlikely king of the world and savior of the world is Jesus. I mean, he's born. He gets this lady not even married yet. She gets pregnant, and then... The, the, you know, she marries Joseph, and they have this baby, and, and do they don't even have money to get a hotel room. They, they're not even born in the inn. He's born like in a stable, in a manger, in a cave because they're so poor, in the dark. That's how Jesus was born, the most unlikely person. And he's ordained as king. He's anointed as king. I mean, the magi show up. What are they doing, man? We're looking for the king, right? And when Jesus died on the cross, what happened? They put a placard. Jesus, King of the Jews. I mean, this is the king, but he's born in the most unlikely way, and he's raised in Nazareth, and he's just a, and nothing even happens for like 30 years, or nothing hardly in the Bible. One little story when he's 13, or nothing else in the Bible, you know, for 30 uh, or 12. There's nothing there for 30 years. Why? Because God's preparing him. And what's he preparing him for? You know, he's preparing him. And, and, and here's the thing about Jesus. It says in the book of Isaiah, there's nothing about Jesus that made you attracted to him. He, well, you didn't look at Jesus and say, well, I really want to follow him. In fact, it says in Isaiah chapter 53, it says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. Basically, Jesus only had one thing going for him. You know what that was? An insane desire to only do what God wanted him to do. All I'm going to do is what God wants me to do. Hey, just let's look through the Bible and all the great stories in the Bible and all the cool stuff in the stories in the Bible. You rarely ever see any of them that some dude is just going, well, I'm going I'm to do something really great for God today. It's always God saying, I want you to do this, and they're going, I can't do that. But since you said that, by faith I'm going to do it, and God does the spectacular through them that they can never do on their own. Jesus in the garden, Lord, I don't want to do this cross thing. But not my will, but your will be done. He goes all the way to the cross and on the cross pays the penalty for our sin. Does the greatest good for the most people. Dead, buried, three days later, resurrected. And when God resurrects him from the life, you know what he does? He makes him king. King of kings and Lord of lords, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. What did he accomplish on the cross? The opportunity for me and you to stop being a Saul and start being a David. That through that, God might do something through you when you obey the word of God that you would just look at and say, God had to do that. Only God could do it. And you come to know the reality of God in your own life. And Jesus becomes king, king of kings and lord of lords. And you become part of his kingdom here to follow after him, right? And one day, Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, man, as my friend Charles Stahl will say, he's coming back as king, King of kings and Lord of lords in the most unexpected way. But when he comes back that way, everybody's going to see him because God has made him king. And we have the opportunity to follow after him. That we can become men or women who have a heart after God through the power of Jesus. Hey, don't miss your opportunity. Right? Don't miss your opportunity. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this for this day, God, thank you for the opportunity to just take a look at Scripture and take a look at the life of David, but not in the life of David. David was a sinner like all of us. He just had a heart to do what God wanted him to do. And in that sense, he points us towards Jesus, a true and better David, who always did what God wanted him to do, and because of that, brought the greatest good for all of us in this room. We have the opportunity to turn from ourselves, turn from our soul, and trust in Jesus. And in the process, become like David. Father, help us today not to miss our opportunity. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.